بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Okay, the next thing we'll talk about the different types of NAT implementations. So there are plenty of advanced NAT con some concepts as well. We are not getting into that. So basically, we have three types of NAT: static NAT, dynamic NAT, and port address translation. Now let's see one by one uh, what is the difference. Now the name itself says the static NAT is static is kind of manual configuration. So static NAT is a method where we'll be doing one-to-one -one mapping. Remember, one-to-one -one mapping means one private IP address, let's say in my example here, 192.168.1.1. Let's assume this is your private IP address, is mapped with some public IP, whatever it is, 5111. Let's say now, similar way, the second private IP is mapped with a second public IP, and the third private IP is mapped with a third public IP. So, it's a kind of one to one mapping. You cannot map multiple IPs to one single IP here, it's a one to one mapping. And this mapping is done manually by the administrator. So administrator will decide uh, which private IP will be using which uh, registered public IP in this case. So every private IP needs to be registered with uh, one separate public IP, one to one, which means one for every one private IP, you need one public IP. But again, the problem with this is it, it's not going to meet the actual requirement of NAT, like generally, why we use NAT in most cases to reduce the number of public IPs required. So that cannot be made in this in this case because if you have 200 users who needs to get translated to internet and you decided to go with a static NAT, then basically you need to have 200 public IPs. So, so it's not going to meet that requirement of reducing the number of public IPs, but it is uh, more commonly used uh, in your network Okay, so useful when the network inside a private network need to be accessible for internet. So this is most commonly used in a scenario where you have some internal server. Let's say this is my HTTP server and I want to host this server on the internet so that the users on the internet, anyone can simply come and connect to my server and access the resources. Let's say this is your company web server. But again, to make this possible, then basically it must be a public IP, right? Because uh, anything coming from the internet only recognizes the public IP. But let's say internally in my LAN or where I place the servers in a separate VLAN, that is your private address. Private IPs are used over there. So it's not possible to change the complete subnet, you know, only for the sake of single uh, server. So what we'll be doing is internally we'll be using a private IP. Let's say the private IP address is 10.2. And when the outside users try to access, we'll convert this public private IP into some public IP, let's say 200.111. So when the client try to access, he will type in, of course, he will type in the URL 200.111, which means he's requesting for this public IP. And this public IP is registered for this customer, so it will reach there. And from there, this router will translate to internal private IP address, and that's how they access. So static, static NAT is still used uh, for hosting the internal servers. That is the only reason or, or the place where we generally see the static NAT uh, configurations. So the second kind of NAT will have something like a dynamic NAT. Now, in the case of dynamic NAT, it is done one to one mapping where automatically the mapping mapping is done automatically by the NAT device. So we can say this dynamic NAT is exact uh, equivalent to the static NAT here. Why? Because here also we do one to one mapping, which means one private IP address should get mapped with one public IP, one to one. But the only difference is the mapping is done by not by the manual, uh, nothing but not by the administrator, but instead the device will do dynamically. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping, which is done by the NAT device dynamically here. But again, as I said, every private IP requires one registered public IP, which means if you have 200 users and all these 200 users need to access internet at the same time, then you need 200 public IPs. So it's a one-to-one, -one, but the only difference is the mapping is done dynamically. So 
to do this, what we have to do is we have to tell what is your private IP range. So you just tell the range of the private IPs by using some kind of ACLs. We'll see in the configuration and you have to tell the range of your public IPs. So when you tell the range, automatically the mapping is done. So it will automatically map. Like let's say there is a host with 10.1.1.1. When it goes outside, it will automatically map with any one public IP from this range, from this pool. Second user may use the second one, third user may use the third one, or maybe random, it depends. But the device will decide which private IP will use which public IP. But again, one thing you also need to keep in mind here, uh, the router is going to allocate the addresses. Like here, I'm assuming the router is a device which translate the, uh, translates. So it's going to allocate the addresses from the pool until all are allocated. Which means, let's say, if I have 100 users in my private network, and on this device, we have defined the range of the public IPs. Let's say I have given the range of public IPs, let's say something around 70, 70 public IPs. So which means out of these 100 users, if the first 70 users are trying to reach, they get translated. So 70 users will get translated. That's that's going to work. But when the 71st user, when he gets, uh, when he wants to go outside and this device do not have any public IP, so there's no public IP to allocate, then basically the packet will be discarded, which means it will be dropped. So the users, uh, which means if you have 100 users, you need to have 100 public IPs again. If you have 1000 users, you need to have 1000 public IPs. And let's say, assume all wants to go to internet, okay? But let's say out of 100 users, you just need only 50 users may go to internet. And in that case, there won't be any problem because we have 70 public IPs. So again, that is a limitation here. So as I said, if all the pooled IP addresses are in use, like in this example, if all the 70 public IPs which are allocated, if they all are used by 70 users from the LAN, then basically the router is going to simply discard the packet. And again, we don't use dynamic NAT uh, as well in today's network because again, the same reason of static NAT, the problem here is you need to have the private to public IP, the same ratio. So if you have 200 users who needs to go to internet, you need to have 200 public IPs. Okay, so for hosting internal servers also, we don't use this. So basically we'll be using the third NAT most common, that is the dynamic NAT overload or the PAT one. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about the third NAT. So the third NAT we call it as a port address translation or it is also referred as dynamic NAT overload. Now, now the difference here is in case of PAT, this is the one which we use for the internet. Now in this scenario, what we'll be doing is, let's say this is my LAN and we have thousands of users and these thousands of users can go to internet with only one public IP, minimum one public IP you can allow. So which means internally we'll be using a private IP addresses, maybe let's say thousands or hundreds. But when they go to internet, they go with one single public IP. Okay, so minimum one, of course, we can have more than one as well. Okay, so which means we don't need to have registered public IPs uh, more here, right? Because let's say now what you need to do is if you want to allow the users to access internet, we need to uh, get one public IP minimum. So one or the smallest range. Okay. So with the help of PAT, PAT is a real reason why we are not running off the valid IPs still. Still today, you know, even in 2020 or, you know, of course, uh, now we'll be using still the private IP, uh, IPv4 addresses because of this PAT here. So PAT is actually extending your IP version 4 uh, in general, the use. But now the question is like, okay, okay, all the users will go to internet when the traffic goes from 10.1.1.1. Let's say he's trying to access some server. He's using 200.1.1.1.2, that is a public IP. And the second user also using the same public IP and the third user also using the same public IP. But now the question is, let's say 
the request is going but when the server is trying to respond so when he's responding he is actually recognizing all the users with the same public ip right all the three requests which are initiated from the lan but now the question is how it is going to differentiate these connections so in order to differentiate it is going to use something called different port numbers so it's going to use the logical port numbers like we have port number range from 0 to 65535 generally there's a range of port numbers and then we have 0 to 1023 up to reserve port numbers so basically it is going to use some unreserved port numbers and each and every connection is still differentiated based on different port numbers and that's the reason we call it as a pat port or a translation because uh, in this case the public ip remains the same but the each and every connection is differentiated by different port numbers so which means logically you can have around 65000 port numbers which means you you can allow the 65000 users can go to internet or allow the internet access with only one single public ip okay this is going to scale well without needing many digital public ips in our case in most of the cases we'll be using only one global ip global means your public ip here okay so most likely we'll be using pat in all the cases in production scenarios and if you're hosting some servers then basically you will be using static NAT also but in terms of configuration we'll try to see all the three types of nats and their configuration and verification examples <laughs>